Welcome to part two of our interview with Peter Humphrey. We pick up with Peter on the day of his arrest, his time in jail, and the sham of a trial that he and his wife went through. We hope you enjoy the show. It's going to be a tough one to listen to. Just a word I of warning. Saw a werewolf with a Chinese menu in his hand. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the view of Wolfpack Research or any of its officers. The views and opinions expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on this program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. We are not investment advisors. We hold no registrations with the SEC, FINRA, or any other regulatory agency, and none of the opinions expressed on this podcast should be considered investment advice. The listener should assume that we have positions in and stand to benefit from any stock or other security mentioned on this podcast. Do your own research before making investment decisions. was uh, evidently taken separately and made to sit in our private office um, where, where both of us had, had desks and had our laptops and so forth. She was made to sit there. So from that moment on, we were separated. We, we didn't get to see each other properly and, and discuss anything for the next two years. Oh, no. And um, there, was no, there wasn't much interrogation in the office. Because the bedroom door was left at least half open, maybe fully open, I could see what was going on out in the main office space. And it was basically dozens of of, P, of PSB people, playing clothes, guy, you know, occupying all of the desks, all of the workstations, going through all of the computers without doing any proper forensic imaging, um, you know, you know ran, ransacking drawers, forcing open filing cabinets, basically going through. None of this was very forensic, and that's one of the first things that struck me about this, is that this raid was not very Is that unusual there? I mean, we don't know whether that's unusual there or not. I can, well, I can, tell you, I can tell you why, okay? You know, you would expect them to be careful, bag and tag, take photographs of an open door before they start touching the stuff inside it, things like that, right? right? Um, they didn't do any of that, and they were not forensically imaging the computers before they started rummaging in the computers. Um, so they were contaminating any evidence that there was there on the computers. And I realized that this was because they knew what they were looking for. They didn't care about anything except the things that they were looking for. Uh -huh. And I, you know, I heard mutterings about GSK, the company name, and which in Chinese is Golan Su Kurt, right? Um, and um, so I realized then that they were actually looking for our GSK files. And they had your passwords already? Um, I don't know how they did that. I've got no idea whether they had passwords or whether I they... Mean, how else would you do it? If you just get in there and you start operating, you, you've got... Right you, you got IT, a good IT. I mean, you can, you can get around. You can bypass. That quickly, huh? Okay. Did they it, let me, Did they present you with a warrant? Do they do they have that kind of thing there? No. They, they, um, they did not show a warrant. Um, and, um, I think, uh, there was a kind of eureka moment, which I remember hearing where, you know, somebody exclaimed that they'd found something that they were looking for, uh -huh. uh, which was, would have been our GSK case files. And then there was another eureka moment when they found some telephone roaming analysis report on Excel spreadsheets on on my laptop because you couldn't really do that then but um in some previous years it was it was possible to get sight of roaming data on a on an investigation subject um and analyze that data to look for connections between your your suspected fraudster and other people in the workplace for example telephone roaming you said yeah tele okay. mobile phone roaming right and this one was some years old um but that was a eureka moment because they wanted to say, what's this doing on your computer? This is illegal. Um, and it was actually from a time when it wasn't illegal. And so this went on for a couple of hours. And at nine o'clock onwards, gradually our staff were trickling in. They were being, as soon as they came in, they were one into our conference room and made to sit in silence around our conference table. That seems bizarre to me, Peter, that yeah. your staff would be trickling in. Wouldn't they see like 30 police officers and say, oh, gee, I forgot something at home and leave? No, they, they, they were not allowed to leave. No. Okay. They, they, they were all kept there. They were kept there all day. They were eventually questioned. 
that uh, obviously there's a lot that we didn't see uh, that was going on as well. And after two hours, Ying and I were both taken away separately. As we left, we could see all our staff seated around this conference table, uh, uh, looking very, very shocked. And we were we were taken out of the building separately in separate lifts and, and away in separate cars. Police had a bunch of cars at the basement of the building. And you never spoke again for two years? We did speak briefly uh, before the trial. Okay. And after six months, we were allowed to actually exchange letters. But that day, from the office, they took us to a building called 803, which is the Shanghai Criminal Investigation Division headquarters. It's a massive concrete hulk. It's a bunker with, with massive underground uh, bits to it. And uh, we were taken into this underground bit, uh, which was corridors full of cells. And you could see other people who'd been detained sort of slumped in chairs and stuff like that as you walk past open doors of these interrogation cells. And each of us were put in one of those cells separately and, and uh, we were interrogated off and on until about 1 a.m. Um, and uh, uh, we, had hard, we had hardly anything to eat and, and we, were, we were very worn out. Um, I guess I can only speak for myself. Um, I didn't know Ying's condition. I was very worn out. And, you know, all my joints were seizing up, and, and uh, um, I was in a state of trauma. And around 1 a.m., they presented a chit saying, oh, our, our boss is Hao Lingbao, uh, want us to um, uh, detain you for a day or so. Uh, and uh, you've got to come with us. And they didn't tell me where they were going to take us. I had no idea that the next place would be, you know, what it was, and the place after that would be what it was. It was it was a total mystery uh, tour. And they actually took us to a police hospital. Okay. Called the Andar Hospital in, 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 in the out, outlying area of, of Shanghai, where rudimentary medical checks were run on us and we had we then had to pay for for that and you know the, the, our phones were ringing all the time and we weren't allowed to answer them while that whole day was going on at this point in the process did you have some hope that this could be over in a day or two well i kept on hoping this is just a one day thing we've not done anything wrong sure you know we've not broken any laws but i you know i realized that they'd been looking at the gsk case right? so at this hospital they did an x-ray they took a bit of blood and so forth this was just kind of tick the box stuff and and then as we were leaving that little hospital one of the policemen as i was just about to get into the police car one of the policemen said to me hold on a minute and he pulled out a pair of handcuffs and said i'm sorry i have to do this it's because of gsk okay and he put the cuffs on me. And that, at that moment in time, I really fell uh, another 300 meters down the mountain. And I, and I made sure I got his name later on. Um, and and um, they drove us, basically, they drove us to this Shanghai Detention Center, which is off of Hunan Road in, in Pudong at that time. It may have moved now. And I didn't realize that that's where we were going until we got there. You know, the mystery ride continued. And then we arrive at this kind like, of fortress-like gate. And they take me into this check, I suppose I should call it a check-in area, where basically, you know, they start strip-searching you, taking and making sure that there's nothing left on, on your person. They document whatever items they've taken off you. And they get you to strip down almost naked, almost naked, and put one of these orange vests on and, they do the prism photo on you. I just couldn't believe they weren't going to let me know after they'd done, let, let me go after I'd done that. I couldn't believe that they were not going to let me go after that. That's how dumb I was at that moment in time. Well, I don't think you were dumb. You were in denial. I mean, you're just self-preservation. Then I was led into the center of this complex, into the yard and then into a building. There were this typical... Uh, typical Chinese five-story, six-story buildings that were based on the Soviet architecture. Um, and they get, get up to, you know, the, the second floor, what they would call the second floor. 
and I'm handed over to another officer in uniform. And he, I, I'm forced to strip naked, you know, and he's checking my ass for any hidden secret weapons and stuff. And then he, he throws me a pair of tatty cotton slippers and, and a pair of tatty um, boxer shorts and makes me walk down this corridor with him and he opens a door and they're a bath because at night time they've got this wood, wood grey wooden covering door over, over the bars of the door. So there's a barred door. Clank, clank, clank. He opens it. He shoves me in. Um, makes me put my arms, my hands back through the bars to remove the handcuffs. And I, I turn around and there's this, you know, cell, brightly lit cell, and a whole heap of little pink mounds on the floor of this cell, which are basically you know, tatty pink quilts. And then heads start popping out from underneath these quilts. Um, mostly shaved heads of Chinese looking heads. And basically there I am, I've been thrown in a cell with 12 other prisoners. And I'm in a total state of shock, trauma and disbelief, you know, calling out to God for help and yeah. uh, God doesn't come, you know. Um, so that's how it began. How big was the cell? The cell, uh, the cells there, were in the Shanghai Detention Center. The cells were about 15 square meters in floor area. And this floor was basically rough wooden boards. And the walls were concrete that had been whitewashed and a lot of the whitewash was peeling off and the ceilings were peeling. Uh, the ceilings were quite high. Um, and so you couldn't reach the lights in the ceiling. And in the corner of the room was a hole in the floor type of toilet hole. And um, there was evidently kind of like a, a chief prisoner in the cell. Yeah, there always, there's always somebody in charge in that cell, right? I didn't get to understand that until later. But um, one of the prisoners came over and said, basically, you sleep there. Uh, and there was right next to the toilet, of course, um, uh -huh. which is where the new guy always has to sleep next to the toilet, right? Uh -huh. So that's, that was the arrival, and uh, it's it's hard talking about this because it's a very traumatic moment. It's a very traumatic image that remains deeply ingrained in my head, and I suffer from PTSD. I've been in and out of PTSD treatment for the last five years, um, and that's one of the high point moments where it's really hard to um, get, escape, escape from it. Are you know? getting any help with it? Are you getting any relief? Does it? Is, does it fade at all? Is it still no, so? Not no, really. no, not really. No. Not really. No. no. And so, so I'm. It's it's hard to help yourself on something like that. Finally, finally, I'm able to help other people. That, that you can't talk about some of these things that I mean, we totally understand. You know, just share what you can, um, and you know, and people understand that. At the end of the day, I don't want to skip to the end. You know, I know you're calling out for God and, and you don't think God comes or he does or he doesn't. But I'll tell you who doesn't come is the United States government or the Canadian government or the British government. None of them really helped you in the end, did they? Um, you know, our governments, mine being British and, and my wife being the American government, provided a good nanny and messenger service. Uh, you know, the people from the consulate would visit from time to time and they would bring messages from family and, and uh, reading material. And during this detention center period, they would also be allowed to bring clothing. Okay. Not food. <laughs> um, so, you know, they, they did provide that support, but they limit their support to imprisoned citizens. Um, they limit it to what they call welfare and lobbying for your health and welfare, right? That's the limit. They, they always say to you, when if, if you raise a question or, or a complaint about why you've been detained and stuff like that, they'll just say to you, we're not allowed to intervene in the case, right? Which is insane, right? And this, this is a problem with all the families who are now mentor. You know, it is insane because it's all very well 
to say that and I could accept that when you're talking about one of your citizens who's been imprisoned in a country that has the rule of law and which has fair and transparent trials and so forth, um, which allows proper defence and so on. Right, so if an American is, is detained in Germany or a Brit is detained in Sweden, um, right, we shouldn't intervene because those countries have similar judicial standards to us. Independent courts. Absolutely. Yeah. But that's not what China is. No. You know, China is under a kind of fascist dictatorship um, called the Chinese Communist Party, and there is no rule of law. It's only the rule of the party. The party is above the law, and there's no in, no separation of the judiciary, the prosecution, the police, and so forth. They're all controlled by the same kennel, dog, communist party kennel, and nobody has a chance. So I think it's insane that you know the American government, the British government, and other Western governments take the view we cannot intervene in the case. This is nonsense. This is nonsense. And you have to see this in the context that among the many millions of prisoners in China today, Chinese and foreign, and regardless what kind of facility they're in, whether they're in pre-trial detention or whether they're among the many millions who are in actual prisons as convicts or among the millions who are in the camps in Xinjiang, there is not a single prisoner in China today who has ever undergone a fair and transparent trial. So I think it is insane to say we cannot intervene in the case. And, and uh, that, was the, that was how I felt uh, when I was um, a prisoner. And it's how I felt, feel today when I, when I hear some terrible stories from families, American families, European families, um, about loved ones who have been locked up not given the chance to have a fair and transparent trial. Peter, who who notified like the embassy? Uh, I, I think your son was in China with you. Who notified your son? Like how how did they know that you you got locked up? Um, it took it took quite a few days. Our son was in Hong Kong at the time. Uh, he had just finished high school and was he he had just started a kind of internship at a cold chain cold supply chain company in Hong Kong. And we just disappeared, you know, we went off radar and he couldn't find us. And over a period of a few days, he was panicking and panicking and panicking. Um, and his boss eventually put two and two together and asked him if he knew which clients we'd been working for recently. And Harvey said, GSK. <laughs> and the guy said, well, there you go. So then, you know, Harvey and other relatives started, you know, making the calls to embassies, consulates, and so forth. Yeah, this is an 18-year-old kid that's, that's dealing with this. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, the, two, the two countries' um, embassies and consulates had not been made aware of anything at that point in time. It was nearly a week, I think, or five days before they were. We, we were detained. We were taken on a Wednesday morning, and it was like sometime on Monday, I think, when, when our consulates finally got... Um, the information and and you're you're in that that shit stained drunk tank that whole time with yeah. 12 other people yeah trying to improve your position the best you can Un unhealthy did you get did you get any kind of relief from anybody else in there were they rough on you the other prisoners or were they kind to you or i mean what was that i mean everybody's covering their heads just from the light right they're under blankets uh but you know what was that like with uh your relationship there First of all, um, I mean, everyone, everyone in there had obviously been new boys at some point in time, so they all knew, they all knew how, how these things work out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, on the first morning, everyone was woken up. Right? There's, there's this artificial bugle which plays in the yard. Do, 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 do. You know, this, this really ugly droning bugle thing. Um, and um, everyone has to get up. And so I hadn't really slept. I was in this total daze and, and awful state, catatonic almost, and, and uh, all of a sudden all these pink mounds are, are getting up 
and there's all this commotion in this small space of these 12 guys and um you know they're they're going and washing their face one by one each one only has maybe a minute or two at the sink there's a there's a very crude sink there with cold water no hot water and uh you know and they're folding up all their quilts and putting them in a stack and and covering the stack with a tarpaulin and then they all start walking i, I use the word circumambulating around the cell in a they're all going round and round like Get the circulation going yeah mice on a, on a treadmill they've all they're all wearing these little flip-flops you know plastic hard plastic flip-flops on their feet so there's a clattering noise and you can hear it going all down the corridor every cell is doing this right now so it's, it's very surreal and weird and the, the cell leader is saying you've got to get up right so I, you know I, I get up as well but i'm in such a daze so i just don't know what to do and um and then you know breakfast time comes and that involves a certain designated um in cellmates who got particular tasks to do they, they lay out the table and the table consists of like four or five little towels which they lay on the floor so pretending that's a table and we all have to sit in a row each side of this towel table on the floor and then there's a serving trolley manned by prison labor um comes down the corridor and passes food in doggy bowls through the bars and, and this gets passed down uh, the line where we're all sitting. And this food is basically very gritty, dry, hard rice uh, with grit in it. Um, and um, some ancient seaweed or something like that. Yeah. Um, no real protein. And, and a little bit of, you know, this Chinese style pickles that have probably been pickled in. In, in caustic acid or something um awful absolutely awful and and i realized that you know the other prisoners have got various little things comforts from some sort of shopping system that was operated uh if you had money uh in an account um and they could buy like you know they could buy a preserved duck egg or something like that or or some better pickle to sort of flavor this awful rice you know and every meal was kind of like that and always eaten that way. And how long were you in uh, there? I was in that, in that, um, in, in that, uh, detention center for about 14 months, almost eating um, that shit for 14 months with those people. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and of course, throughout the period leading before the trial, the trial happened in the 13th. I was being interrogated very frequently. Yeah very repetitively what was that like so the whole you know the whole hardship and the, the duress of diet um, the sanitary conditions having to uh, live in a cell with 12 people and no furniture you know no bunk beds or anything like that um it just grinds them down it grinds these detainees down and the whole idea is that you know you get so ground down that you just give in to the police interrogators and, and um, confess to crimes that you didn't commit. And so that's what I endured for 13 months before the case went to trial. You, so you resisted that for, for, for some time. You're just like, no, I didn't do anything wrong. I mean, I, I, have, I have never confessed to doing anything wrong, never. And even in court, when we went to court, both of us fought against the prosecutor and the judge. Yeah, it's funny because in the Chinese media, the, the, they always uh, kind of headline with your confessions, right? Like you they, confess. that's, bull, that's, that's absolute bullshit. Yeah, shocker. And, and uh, you know, in, in, the, in the courtroom, you know, we fought tooth and nail, but they cut a lot of that out of the trial transcript, and they didn't include it in the feeds that they were putting out to and the they, media. And, and they didn't allow foreign press in the courtroom, but they allowed... No. Uh, Chinese press, and I, I guess it's said that you didn't want foreign press in the courtroom, which I find preposterous. That's, not, that's a that's a bit of a distortion. I mean, what happened was that before the trial, the judge um, called us to a pre-trial meeting, and he said it was going to be held in secret. And I protested. Um, actually, behind the scenes, the diplomats protested as well. Uh, 
uh, I demanded that the trial be open and transparent. Yeah, and I said, okay, if you don't want to have uh, Western journalists in there, um, but have diplomats and relatives. Okay, I was trying to kind of strike a compromise. So it wasn't that I said I didn't want Western journalists in there. That's totally fabricated that statement. Yeah. But I, I agreed with the judge that he could exclude Western journalists if I could have diplomats and family in there. You know, witnesses who knew us and, and, and were following um, us closely. If you didn't agree to that, do you think he would have allowed it? I mean, I mean, it doesn't sound like he would have. No, no. I mean, I, and then you would you wouldn't have gotten any of it. He wasn't going to allow me to have the full the full suite of openness. Um, so I went for what I thought was most important at the time, and the, you know, I wasn't in the strongest of positions. You can imagine. Yeah. No, yeah. I don't think you were. And I and I, and I'll tell you, from my position, you know, I was doing this for a living too. You know, I, I had a, a business similar to yours, and then I see you on television one day in a orange jumpsuit, like handcuffed, so you couldn't move your. It didn't look like you move your hands an inch apart. I almost like I envisioned that you were, you were manacled from the bottom too, but you said you weren't. But you were being marched from each side in and out of the courtroom. No, it wasn't a court. Okay, so this this is a, this this t this TV. Uh, incident. Okay, I was it, on, on one Saturday morning, uh, almost two months after we had been detained. Police came, and they told me our our Lingdao, you know, our boss wants you to meet the media. You know, Chinese phrase is "jie meiti," receive the media. Well, I thought, what was going on here? You know, um, and they said that oh, there's been a lot of international media coverage about you, and and uh, our bosses want you to meet. Chinese media. And so initially I refused, but bear in mind, I'm in the interrogation cage, right? And, and, and in handcuffs and I'm a trapped animal. I initially, I, I refused so I didn't want to do it. And they were pressuring me. And in the end, I said, well, look, I'll, I'll meet a few writing journalists if, you, um, if it helps. And uh, no cameras, no filming. And they didn't like that. Uh, they said, oh, but no, we can blur the image. Okay? And, of course, we all know very well that later on they didn't blur the image uh, in every broadcast. Um, and I, I said, no, 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 I don't want any images at all. Okay. And they seemed to agree to that. Yeah. But then the following Monday morning, strange things happened. Um, around, like, 8.30 or 8 a.m., a patrol doctor who patrolled the corridors of the detention center came up to our bars and, and said, Peter, this is a, a pill for you. It will help you to sleep because I wasn't sleeping. And within half an hour, I was feeling extremely dopey. Yeah. Yeah. And I never experienced such an effective <laughs> sleeping aid or, or whatever uh, in the rest of my time in captivity as that one. And then half an hour later, uh, one of the warders comes to the door and throws a brand new orange vest into the room. So that's for Peter, change your vest. Yeah, just for the best. Yeah. And, you know, so I replaced my very tatty, smelly, uh, shabby vest with this brand new one. And then another, like, 15 minutes later, a bunch of warders came to the door again and called me out. And I said... Peter's going to Jer Matey, meet the media. And I, fuck, I was totally unprepared for this. And some of my soulmates were looking at me and said, are you sure you're going to do this? And, and, and uh, so you see that classic um, image of me being walked down a corridor yeah. with, one, with one warder on each side of me wearing this short-sleeved um, shirt, the summer uniform. They were senior warders. They were not investigative police. And... Those two senior warders were never unkind to me in the entire time that I was in that facility. And you said, I just want to be clear, you're saying the word warders, like, you know. Well, what we mean in, in, in England, we use the word warder to mean an officer, an officer working in a, in a prison. We yeah. don't call them guards. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you might call them guards. Right. And so they led me down this corridor. There was another warder who was filming this as we went. And when we got to the end of the corridor, we turned left to go over a kind of bridge that 
takes you into the neighboring block, which is the interrogation block, which I was familiar with. And as we turned that corner to go into the interrogation block, I was ambushed. Uh, a gang of uh, people with cameras, mm. including still cameras and, and, and filming cameras, TV cameras, just came out and were, the flashes were pinging and all that and so forth. I was completely ambushed. Um, uh, this, is, this, is, this was done without my consent. And they, so they marched me down the interrogation block and put me into a very large interrogation room, which was set up like a little tribunal. And there was a podium and about seven or eight um, of the PSB officers were seated there, including a couple of those involved in my interrogations uh, and some of their senior um, commanding officers. And there were a bunch of warders, officers from the detention facility in the room on, on their feet and all these camera wielding you know, people who I hadn't consented and allowed to film me. And I was placed inside the steel cage in the middle of the cell. It was a tall cage with very thin steel bars. And so in the images of this event, you can see vertical lines behind my back. That's the back of the cage, okay? And the, the man who was my daily you know, chief interrogator was there in, they were all in uniform today. Usually, usually the PSB were in, in plain clothes. My chief interrogator stood at the corner of the cage, outside of the cage. I was locked into this locking chair, you know, with a locking bar and I've got handcuffs on and the cage door is shut. Because you're a dangerous animal. Yeah, dangerous animal. And, and you've got lenses being pushed through the gaps of the bars and so forth. And this chief interrogator has got a clipboard with him and a list of questions and a list of things he wants me to say and so it's, it's all been scripted yeah one of the cameras has the the logo of cctv on it but as far as i can see hardly any of these so-called journalists are writing scribes it's pretty much all cameras mm -hmm. and the the police officer who did this his name is ding jagong he's a he's a inspector rank and he read these questions and he kept repeating because I, I wasn't giving the right answers you know they were trying to get me to say yeah i broke the law i did this i did that and i'm really sorry you know um that's what they were trying to do and i was trying to answer and qualify things with ifs and buts and not to self-incriminate myself i was navigating between um the need to get the fuck out of that cage by satisfying them with something and the need not to incriminate myself by falsely confessing to a crime. And this was really hard because I was drugged, as you know, and, and doping. And I was the trapped animal, as you say, in a cage, nowhere to run. What am I supposed to do? If, well, I, look, look, everybody thinks they're a tough guy until they're a trapped animal in a cage and then yeah. and they're drugged i mean you know i would have liked to have seen you sing god save the queen and piss your pants and see what ding dong could do with that but i'll see if i can arrange it for you yeah <laughs> well i'm not singing god save the queen i we've got the star spangled banner but i i'm sure to handle it the same way you did you know of course i mean you're drugged and you're in there and what choice do you have? What I mean, none, none. You're gonna do what Ding Zhu Dong or Ding Dong kind of tells you to do, and then they edit that tape, so all your qualifications and your butts and your ands and your whatever are edited out. Yeah, I mean, we they did the same thing with my wife, okay, and a year, a year later they did it again without the cage, um, just before our trial. The objective was to completely, you know, prejudice public opinion sure. against us to uh -huh. prejudice any possibility of a, a good outcome from a trial and this first one was was done before we hadn't even been indicted you know we weren't indicted till the following year there is no good outcome for a trial i mean what's the conviction rate in china 99 percent 99.9 percent i think you better get oh, it right yeah yeah 99.9 percent .9%. so mm. You know, I, I, I mean, and the appeal, the, the the success rate for appeals is about zero. 
yeah, yeah, there that's ninety nine nine nine. But I, I, I guess this was to sway foreign opinion more than domestic opinion. No, because no, 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 no. Because no. no. initially this this was broadcast in Chinese on CCTV channel in uh-huh. China. Yeah, and then it and then it was packaged repackaged by CGTN for broadcast overseas. CGTN wasn't called CGTN, then it was called CNTV or something like that. Um, But anyway, it's today's CGTN. So it went first to the whole Chinese nation, and then it went to the whole world. Was that that questioning that that they did, was that the typical type of interrogation, or was it more severe? Do you mean the questioning in the cage, or...? You said that you know you were continually interrogated. What was that interrogation process? And again, if you can't speak on it, Peter, I, I, I understand. But like, was it, was it just like, hey, sit down, I'm going to ask you these hundred questions a hundred times, or was that, was there? Yeah, a they, phys- did they hit you with a phone book or a bag of oranges, or you know, or, or was it just like, No, you know? I mean, I was never, I was never hit or beaten or or physically tortured in the sense that most people understand the word torture. Is more mental torture. Although the actual overall overall conditions were torture. Yeah. Um, but the, the interrogations w- which we went through, and I know it was the same for, for my wife after we got out, I learned her story too. These interrogations normally consisted of them getting you to restate your entire life fucking story to them, first of all. And, and then they would show you documents from our case files, you know, cases of work that we had done for our clients. And they were, they had singled out things like, you know, AIC records and, and um, HUCO records and things like that. You know, um, and they would ask, how did you get that? You know, who provided that in this case? And I couldn't always remember because some of these, some of these cases pre, predated um, the introduction of the privacy law that they were trying to screw us up under, yeah. you know, <laughs> and and so this went on and on and on. So it was what they were doing was we we were arrested because of one person's uh, grievance, right? And and that became evident at some point in the interrogations, and I'll tell you about that. But they were also build, trying to build this massive statistic around our our, our case. To, to try and suggest that we'd, you know, committed millions of offences of personal information violations, that we'd made millions and millions of, of dollars from just buying and selling information, ignoring the fact that we were in the business of analysis and problem solving. And so we had so many interrogations, which, which is which were just about looking at extracts from our case files from our office and signing saying, I got this from so-and-so, or, you know, that sort of thing, and then thumbprinting each bloody page. It was nonsense. Um, The key thing was that, you know, one day in one of the interrogations, they come out with, let's call it a photo parade on paper. So they show me a sheet with eight faces on it, right? And they say, which one of these is Jason Tsai. Okay, uh, J- Jason Tsai was an independent consultant who had been our contractor, and he had been the person who supplied personal information about Vivian Shu. This is the only instance from our case files where they said, please identify the guy. And just before they did that, they had been showing me documents from the GSK case file, getting me to confirm where did this piece of information come from and that piece of information come from and so forth. And then they come out with this photo parade, right? And you can just see, you know, the dollar signs flashing in their eyes and and the eureka moment. uh, When I say, this one is Jason Science. Right, that is what they wanted all along from these interrogations. The rest of it is just fluff and padding, right? And this was so important for them that they then got a, another group of PSB officers to come in and get me to do this identification again, okay? And I think Ying was put through a similar process. And uh, this was it. You know, this was the key thing. Just like on the day of the raid, you know, the ding, ding, ding sound, came on when they found the GSK case file. 
And in this particular interrogation, the bells rang again when I successfully identified the photo of the guy who supplied us with Vivian Schiller's information. It was totally clear. And so I said to them, I said, how is he, by the way? I understand he's in here as well. And they looked a bit shocked. Because, you know, there's a whisper network inside the detention centre, and it goes center to cell to cell, because sometimes people get moved from one cell to another. So I knew, not long after I got in there, I, I discovered that Jason Tsai was in there as well, right? He's the only one of our contractors who was arrested in relation to our own arrest. And I knew he was in there because I met someone uh, in one of my first cells who had spent a bit of time with him in a cell. And he had some speculations on, on what it was that had upset the authorities. I don't think Jason had told him everything. But anyway, after I got out, I mean, that was all confirmed because um, we made contact with a friend of Jason's after our release who confirmed that Jason had spent exactly the same time in captivity as we had. Uh, he'd been released around the same time and that Jason had told him it was all because of the investigation into Vivian Schur. So, so that's what it was. And so most of these investigations were stupid waste of time. If they had only just focused honestly on Vivian Schur and our GSK work, and just talked about that and nothing else, because that's really all the, re the only reason for arresting us. I could have saved them a lot of time. And I, I, I also, you know, would have had very focused and persuasive arguments to deal with that. But they just shrouded the whole thing in, in so much smoke um, and built up all these horrendous statistics of how many offences we'd committed, which were totally untrue. So take us to the trial now. You're you're there. How long did your trial last? One day. Yeah, that's oh, that's a long trial in China. Mm. Sometimes they're like two hours or an hour. Mm. Or less, yeah. Um, well, it happened in August of 2014. Um, originally, it was scheduled for the day which was the anniversary of my father's death. You know, and by this time, you're kind of paranoid. And, and uh, you think, oh, did they do that on purpose? Um, and um, then they changed it to so one day later. Uh, but shortly before the trial, um, there was there was an issue surrounding Ying's brother. She had an elder brother called Bernard, and uh, he was living in America for many years. They were very very close as siblings, and you know they were the last two survivors of their family line. And in April. I was informed by my consulate that Bernard had died from a fast-acting cancer. And, uh, you know, it was clear that he had aggravated the cancer because of all the hard work he was doing, trying to lobby for us and, and help us and save us. He had died and, and that his widow did not want me to in any way pass this information on to Ying at that time because the family were concerned that she might just have a nervous breakdown and not be able to um, handle the case very well. And uh, I mean, this this tore me because I, I knew she would want to know, and I knew that she had a right to know. But you know, basically, my sister-in-law and, and and the family in general, the Chinese family, were insistent that Ying should not be told this um, immediately. And so I kept it secret. By that time, we were writing to each other intermittently through a very difficult system. Um, they allowed us to do that after six months in captivity. So by this time, we were writing to each other. And I, I had to refrain from, from mentioning this, uh, the death of her brother. But then a week or two before the trial, one of the police officers told me that Ying had been informed written out about her brother's death and so I was just kind of imagining every day before the trial I was imagining you know, uh, what this had, could have done to her you know how, how devastated she would be and on, on, on the morning of the trial you know we were taken separately and we didn't see each other uh, en route to the court we were taken separately uh, to the court and while I was being escorted through the court building i passed a, a staircase 
I was at the bottom of the staircase and I looked up and I saw Ying being led along the corridor just up the top of the stairs and she kind of turned and said good morning Peter and then I said I'm terribly sorry about your brother and she just kind of exploded you know no, what? Oh no! And I said, "Well, he's gone. They told me you knew." Oh no! And, and she didn't know. She flew into a rage. She started shouting, "Murderers!" And I said, "Don't blame these officers. It's not, it is. They're all killers." She's screaming. You know? And so that's how our day at the courthouse began you oh. know, on a very on a very bad note. And um, oh man! You know, eventually, you know. I, when I was taken, in, I was taken into the courtroom, made to sit in the courtroom, and a few minutes later, the doors flew open, and she was she appeared in the door with bailiffs on each side of her, and she broke loose from from them because <laughs> they'd been holding her up, and she ran across the you know the, the center of the courtroom to her defendant seat and just sat down, and, and these officers were chasing after her. <laughs> I guess they thought she was going to kill the judge or something. Um, but, um, yeah, and it, it was a hysterical entry into the courtroom. And then, and then she shouted at the judge, I've just been told that my brother has died. Yeah, and that's how it began. I, I, there's, meet, there's meeting Ying and, and sitting with her for a while at dinner. And it's not long before you just, you really develop a respect for, like, a quiet strength that she has. Absolutely. Absolutely. I should say that, you know, she comes from a very good Chinese family, uh, a family of intellectuals, a family of scholars. You know, her mm-hmm. father, uh, who'd, he'd, who who died in, in 2003, her father was the head of nuclear physics at Peking University wow. for decades. You know, and her, her mother was professor of petrochemistry. Uh, no, she was a professor of chemistry at the Petroleum Institute. Which is another senior academic. Probably issue. not that well thought of by Maoists. Well, they were treated very badly because they had both obtained their PhDs in America in the 1940s, and then they went back to China, like, like many patriotic scholars did in 1951, to help build the motherland, as as they as they say. And of course, they were all tricked into going back as soon as they got back. Yeah, yeah. China wanted their scientific knowledge and skills. But it persecuted the hell out of them and treated them as though they were suspect American spies and so forth. So every time there was one of those political, you know, a rectification or a purge and stuff like that, her parents were always picked on, victimized. And, uh, you know, they didn't deserve it. They were patriotic intellectuals. Her mother was even, you know, an ideological communist as a young person. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> she wasn't by the time she died, but... Uh, yeah, so, so Yin came from a long tradition of scholarship, and, and her brother also was a doctoral level, a PhD in astrophysics. They were aristocrats, in a way, in Chinese society, in a certain sense, but they were treated very, very badly. Well, I mean, and they were intellectuals in a society that didn't yeah. really, that may have valued intellectuals, but not intellectuals that had independent thinking. That's right, that's right. So, you know, she was... Uh, from that family and she she is a very very dignified yes scholarly individual herself yes. you know she lost a lot of her education during the cultural revolution and she's made it all up through through self education since then and uh you know she she's very very scholarly dignified musical and and so forth everything everything that most of the people we met during this ordeal were not um when I, when I say most of the people I met, I'm talking about the very, very low cultural level of police officers and prosecutors and judges and so forth. You know, they're people with very low level of education. Well, you know, she was eventually in everywhere she went too. Not to not not to get off you because we're getting we're getting to your kind of final destination in China, and, and she had one too. And she had told me the story uh, how she became so really appreciated by the people she was spending time with, if you will, as the way we put it, and including the guards, that at one point one of the one of the um, warders um, had asked her, what do you want? What can I do for you? 
and uh, I think she said a banana, right, or something to that effect, uh, because you couldn't get fresh fruit like that, and and that guard brought in a banana for her, which was a real treat. Was it was it a banana or was it an apple or which what was it? I think it's either a banana or a couple of sachets of coffee or something like that. No, but it, it, was a it, it was a, it was it was a piece of fruit. It was the banana, yeah, and it would have been maybe around her birthday or something like that. Yeah, and it was because of all the help that she would give people, and and the strength that she would give but them. She, and, I mean, Ying is very fair to our captors and jailers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and by that I mean the officers in the detention center and in in her prison, women's prison, she's fair. You know, there were good guys and bad guys. And, you know, if she was writing about this, she would describe both cat categories. And, you know, I would say the same, you know, I did encounter some good um, officers in the detention center, as well as some nasty ones. And, and in the prison, although I was victimized constantly, daily and hourly by, several particular officers um there were some who were reasonable well was that in the prison that you were victimized and how were you victimized yeah well each cell in the prison after our trial each cell has an officer in charge assigned to the cell so that officer is the one who comes and does the role and this is now in the prison in shanghai yes in my case, it's in Chengpu prison, and in Ying's case, it's in the Shanghai Women's Prison in Songjiang. And in uh, that uh, cell and in that prison, how many people are in that cell and that prison size, and how big is it? Similar number. It's 12 bunks per cell. And then you had bunks at that point, so once you went to prison. We had uh, two-tier bunks, yeah. Okay. And and in that prison as well, there's there's a prisoner that's in charge of the cell. There is a, yeah, a cell leader, we call it, yeah. Right. In my case, my first cell in Chengpu prison, the cell leader was a Nigerian gangster. Mm. Wonderful. Uh, not necessarily the credit card scam kind, the kind that will maybe kill you. <laughs> no, he, 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 he was the heroin smuggling kind. Yeah, okay, so the kind that will kill you. Yeah, mm. so for all these people that think they're going to go in the cell and automatically become the leader of the cell, which, you know, of course, I would think that. Uh, remembering who I was, not who I am today. You, as Peter pointed out to me, will get sorted quickly. That's right. I think that the key the key thing about those officers I mentioned is that you know I I had not pleaded guilty or confessed to any any crime. You know, contrary to this fourth and fourth TV appearance, um, and contrary to the Chinese reporting about the trial, neither of us had pleaded guilty or confessed to any crime. And when we arrived in the prison, you know, the prison's job, first of all, is, is to crush the prisoner even further and get them to write uh, a written confession of guilt and a repentance report, report, and to get them to write and rewrite these again and again and again every, every week. And I refused to do it. And I, I knew I, at that point, I knew you know, how long my sentence was limited to. I was sentenced to two and a half years, right? And so I, I just refused. I mean, prisoners in there with long sentences would comply with this stuff and would falsely confess to crimes they hadn't committed even in order to, to re reduce their sentence through merit points and, and get out of there a bit sooner. But I refused. And so there was one particular you know, cell captain. Like we call them captains in Chinese prisons. That's, the, that's what the officers are called. Mm -hmm. Everyone is called a captain. Captain Wei was in charge of my cell. He was assigned to the cell because I was in the cell. His assignment was to be hard on me. Every day when I'm, I might be out sort of in, in, to, in, in the common room, there's a sort of activity room where we eat our meals and, and where forced uh, manufacturing labor was also carried out between meals. I might be in there. Right, or I might have been taken to meet an officer and have a conversation. I would come back and find that Captain Way had been into the cell and had tossed out all my belongings, a few belongings I have from my drawer and from my overhead cupboard, just toss them all around the room, things like that. And, and um, 
a key thing for me was I needed medical attention because I knew I had a prostate problem and possibly prostate cancer. And they had been withholding that, the necessary investigations and so forth um, while I was in the detention center and my symptoms were getting worse and worse. And you after. did end up having prostate cancer. Yeah, I, Which, I, I had I, after I, after I was released, it was diagnosed properly. Well, they, they could have they could have figured that out very very quickly from that initial. Yeah. They didn't want to. They didn't want to. That and, initial hospital visit you had on day one, where they took your blood, a simple PSA could have done it. Doing any real testing, and Captain Way, you know, every time I asked to be taken to see a doctor or a clinic and get this investigated. Captain Way and his superior, Captain Jal, would say that you haven't signed the confession. Mother. Right. Uh. So, so basically, you know, they were playing me like that, using my health as an instrument of extortion to extort um, a false confession from me. And you still didn't I, do it. And I refused. And so I never got I never got I never got seen properly until the twenty first month. I finally managed to get with some lobby, more lobbying from my consulate and embassy, I managed to get um, an MRI. And sure enough, it found a tumor, right? And, and so I then, I then managed to notify my son uh, during one of my allocated telephone calls from, from the prison you are allowed, in theory, to call home. Eventually, you know, over the next few weeks, I could sense things were moving, and that they were they were going to try and get me out of there because this was this was a, a serious risk for them. But Captain Way was a key figure in all of this activity. During the winter, he took away my warm clothes. Another prisoner managed to get something for me, and then he took that away from me. Things like that he was doing. I res I responded also by trying to play off his politics to play him off. Uh, against other officers in in our cell block and towards the end it was working so thoroughly that he was getting really really upset and uh, uh, they basically separated him from me and they put me into what we called the sub brigade which is like a, a sub block of our block separately run and far fewer prisoners in it foreigners so towards the end i was separated from captain way um, because I, I, I had complained about him, and, and uh, he was really pissed off. Do you ever dream about smashing his face in? I don't know about that. I would just like to see him face justice, you know? That's that's what I just said. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's... <laughs> that's what I think I said anyway. I, I mean, I, I, I just don't – how you could not dream about having the tables turned in some way where – you would, yeah. What a dick. And, and, and I wonder, in the, in the better sense of you, maybe if he knew the tables were turned, and you you treat him like a human and say this is how it should be done, but what you did was inhuman. It was inhuman. Mm. And you know, I I, I have um, contact with ex ex prisoners when they get released from Chengdu. I, I, I try to track down people who've been released and. Uh, interview them to kind of get updates on the situation in the prison and you know I, i've got a number of letters that have been smuggled out and he's still there captain way yeah he's still there he's been promoted he's okay. in charge of the oh. brigade he's in charge Jeez. of the block yeah well now we're on to something do we know where he lives yeah. i'm just saying just whisper <laughs> it to me nobody's listening all right well i mean that is and, and the fact that all the tragedies that you've talked about up to and including like right before the court case that you you had to see your wife and, and go through that with her about her brother, you you start to realize that you're having a medical condition. You do. It's a serious medical condition. And, and then it got even after you released, it had to get worse because it wasn't treated early. And and really, I mean, I I don't know how you couldn't somehow feel that, again, the medical condition goes back to GSK and the job you took, not only, you know, how you were treated in prison, but this whole thing changed the trajectory of your life, your wife's life, your son's life. And to this day, you maintain and believe wholeheartedly you did nothing wrong. That's correct. Absolutely. Yeah. And 
I think, um, you know, I think I may have told you before that, uh, you know, obviously I went into my, my China experience uh, 46 years ago, being very fascinated yeah. and, and interested um, of Chinese culture. And over these years, you know, I've made hundreds, if not thousands of Chinese acquaintances and friends and, and uh, uh, not to mention the family. And, yeah. and, you know, so I'm somebody who went into that 46 years ago, a guy who loved China in a way. Mm -hmm. and, and it's important to say that I still do love China. Um, but unfortunately, you know, China is now ruled by a regime that is no longer opening up and reaching out. It is now ruled by a regime which is impossible to love. And that's the regime that did this to me and my family, who just destroyed our lives, destroyed our business, it orphaned our son for two years and so forth, it ruined his career plans as well. You can't stop loving the things that you loved about China because of this. You can love China and her people. Yeah, absolutely. And absolutely, uh, you know, I'm I am all for that. I certainly love her people. Yeah, this regime, uh, the PRC government, and I'll say it, President Xi, you know, is a dictator, uh, Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> so I and now that you're here in the United States, or you're in you're in you're in the UK, and I'm here in the United States, like look. They spy on us here. They tap our phones here. Uh, their, their reach has gotten even bigger, more vast, and more dangerous. And if there aren't people like you talking about it, then it's just going to, you know, and, and affect other people's lives more quickly. And and I think we should say that people should, should understand there's some happy parts of this in the end. I mean, Harvey's doing very well. Mm -hmm. uh, your son obviously raised very well and, and very successful. And to the extent that you and Ying are getting on with your lives, how is that going? I, I, I know it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of humor going on. Uh, I, I hope you can find more of it because that's a, a medical remedy for a lot of things. Well, you know, we don't we don't have any employment. We don't have a business, and and we're not going back to either of those situations. We basically live. On our retirement savings and, and uh, I spend um, a lot of my time commenting on China I provide sound bites to, to the media I, I, um, I also occasionally write articles myself and um, I am very active in uh, efforts to discredit Chinese television for its role in extracting and packaging and broadcasting forced confessions. This year, I successfully um, managed to get the UK regulator to remove the broadcasting license of CGTN in the UK. Yeah, and sanction now, them. Yeah. And, I, and I'm now working with others to achieve the same thing in other parts of the world. So I'm kind of a bit of an activist. And, you know, I, I've toyed with the idea of writing a book. I mean, we're not quite there yet. But I've also spent time litigating against GSK. And, uh, and over the last two years, I found myself increasingly being approached and drawn into relationships with families around the world who have somebody today in a position similar to the position we were in mm -hmm. when we were behind bars. And so I provide them with practical hand-holding advice uh, on how to handle the situation, how to make life behind bars easier for their, their family member, sharing contacts and you know doing some lobbying. When I was visiting the US recently, I was lobbying one of the congressional committees and very, very, very um, good result where it ended up with a couple of your legislators lobbying the Federal Communications Commission with regard to the CZTN situation. So those are the things that occupy me. And Ying uh, occupies herself mostly with research on her family's history, going right back into the late Qing dynasty, with the aim of eventually writing a book about her family's history and using that story to reflect the history of modern China over the last century or so. Interesting. And I think that's a very promising project. Um, she's full of enthusiasm for it. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, she, she's been relearning 
the violin, which she learned when she's a child. So between 6 and 7 p.m., I get a free concert, violin music, wafting down the stairs. I bet she's already very good. And when she's finished her session, she comes down the staircase singing. Oh, well, that's something else. And then, and then she makes you a bowl of fruit every night. <laughs> we, she, yeah, she cuts fruit after our dinner every night. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, I, yeah, there, you know, I, I find some, find some little joys and pleasures. I know that's easy for me to say, you know, I'm not a religious man. And, you know, I know at some point you kind of reached out and said, where's God to help me? But, you know, it sure seems like there's a hand in helping others. What you're doing right now is kind of God's work, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, these families have nobody to turn to. And then when you're there to give practical advice, that sure seems like, you know, that's that's a very healthy thing and a very godly thing to do. I certainly appreciate it. You know, I don't ever plan on going to China. I'm not sure that would be well received. But if I did, I'd love to have you in my corner. <laughs> Uh, and I'm glad you're helping these people. I, I, I heard I've I've heard of the work you've done there, and that's got to really be a godsend to these families. And and I think the wheel is is turning. Uh, I mean, you know, it, it, Enos Cantor speaks out. There was Women's Tennis Association over Peng Shua, who had her forced confession on TV about the alleged rape. I, I think. <laughs> And hopefully it's not too late. I think that people are starting to wake up a little bit, and and notice. Yeah, I think it's I think it's too late. Uh, but I'm glad that there are individuals that are putting what's left of their life back on the line, um, like you, Peter. So thank you for that. Is there anything you'd like to impart on us, and any advice you'd like to give, or any way you'd like people to reach out to you, or or read your work, or follow you? support it yeah all i would say at the moment is that uh, things are not going to improve in china until there is the change at the top and until that change happens it will not be safe for anybody in china i i totally agree i totally agree any way people can follow you or do you want them following you i'm very active as a commentator on linkedin okay there you go linkedin over the last five years i've had quite a lot of influence on the debate about China on the LinkedIn platform. Let's follow Peter Humphrey on LinkedIn. Uh, I, I follow him on LinkedIn and I see that he writes some great articles. I, you know, look, I can't say I hope you enjoyed this podcast. I can say I hope you found it informative and that <laughs> you follow Peter and you, you take it seriously. We'll be following his case and hopefully he'll join us again as a returning champion on China issues. Peter, thank you. You've been gracious with your time and give Ying my best. Thank you very much. You guys stay well. And to our listeners, thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, leave us a comment. Give us a retweet. Follow us on Twitter. Thanks for joining us. 